Eric is a um, professor in Carnegie Mellon University. He has done lots of work spanning many areas of machine learning, including uh, developing statistical machine learning methods and algorithms, and also lots of application in social networks and computational biology, and uh, even computer vision and natural language processing. Uh, he recently is also pushing this direction of combining machine learning with uh, a large-scale system and architecture, and he's going to tell us more about his uh, venture in this direction. All right. Well, it's such a great pleasure to be back in Berkeley, especially I saw my old advisor, uh, uh, Professor Karp, in the seat. It's really a great honor to have him here. And I saw my kind steward yesterday, so it's a very good reunion you know, after so many years. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some of my uh, recent work uh, in uh, the so-called system and algorithmic co-design. Uh, I heard a few talks this morning already. This one will be a little bit different in terms of the flavor and the style. Okay, I'm going to also present a few theorems, but without proof. I'm going to more focusing on presenting the open problems that we are facing you know, in uh, designing efficient, uh, uh, deployable machine learning algorithms. So this is perhaps a way, sorry, OK, this is the way many people see machine learning. Maybe you guys will be laughing at it, but people do see machine learning like this. They want the machine learning algorithm to be a black box that you throw in data, and that you get uh, the answer out of it, which is kind of naive. But if we look at ourselves and you know, how we see computer, it's no different from here. right? We are programming you know, on a black box, writing algorithms. And we wish the box to do what it's supposed to do without any error. And then we can analyze our algorithm in terms of its convergence, uh, bounds, and all that uh, with uh, no worry about uh, whether the machine goes wrong or right. That's why in many of the theorem, you don't see any coefficients talking about the machine behavior. And that's actually uh, not necessarily you know, the ideal situation you are going to face in industry. So here, I, I've been working in industry for a while, and uh, I had a startup. And our goal is to offer machine learning solutions to big data users. And typically, after you have the data and you are assigned the task and given the hardware, you need to figure out this whole thing in the middle, which includes algorithm, model, implementation, system, architecture, and so forth. And uh, the kind of solutions that we are having now is really a uh, handcrafted, monolithic kind of uh, one-off solution, you know, one for each uh, particular problem. Maybe the same problem solved by different people would be also different. Therefore, many of the results are non-repeatable. So it's uh, actually a big barrier right now, causing machine learning and AI not to be very popular in you know, the greater industry. And this is actually one of the personal kind of experience I had before. You know, we many years ago developed a pretty uh, good algorithm for social network embedding which uh, were able to, in fact, embed uh, a one million node network uh, using a single machine in like uh, a few minutes. So it's pretty amazing. You know, we published quite a few papers uh, on this topic. But then you know, we want to uh, bring this algorithm to Facebook. And uh, the kind of problems they give is this big. They say, oh, one million is pretty good, but uh, after all, my network is uh, a billion. Maybe you should uh, demonstrate your algorithm on a tenth of that, which is 100 million. OK? And of course, they are going to offer you not one machine, but maybe a cluster of 1,000 machines. Well, if you are naive and say, well, let's use Hadoop and deploy this algorithm on 1,000 machines, maybe I should have seen a 0.6 minute kind of uh, completion because uh, my resource grow 1,000 times, my problem grow 100 times, right? But the choice is that if you really run it, as we did, uh, it doesn't finish in more than a week. So why that's the case? That means the system is not ideal. There are something going, going on in the system which is beyond what the algorithm can handle. So that's why I want to uh, take another look at this problem which we often solve in machine learning and see how really to ground these type of uh, solutions on a real computational infrastructure. Right? So here is a typical machine learning setup. You are doing a optimization uh, problem where you set up the loss function, which is your model. You specify your parameters. You may also introduce some regularizers to control the complexity, or maybe introduce prior knowledges. This is the part of uh, maybe 95% of machine learning. 
The other five percent maybe goes to the algorithm. We come up with, uh, you know, very typically not a closed form algorithm, but a iterative convergent algorithm. You know, finding a fixed point and iterate using some update equation. So this one is the holy grail of that algorithm. You need to figure out whether this one is a gradient, a projected gradient, or a smooth version of that, or other, you know, second order terms and so forth. And then you're going to do this iteration, hopefully without any trouble. But in modern days, this particular operation is going to be under severe challenge. Why? Because uh, in many industry problems, we are really uh, facing either very big data or big model, which uh, uh, lets you to face this scenario. Maybe you are going to, you know, every time, you know, update a gigantic vector or matrix of parameters, which could be having 100 million parameters which is not often not, not unusual in deep learning, for example, these days, or even a high dimensional regression problem. Or if you really are working on huge data, then this one also will explode. And therefore, uh, you're going to swipe you know, a terabyte of data maybe in every iteration. That's also very, very difficult. And consider doing this you know, for indefinite number of iterations is uh, something quite challenging because uh, in that case, you know, you probably need to think about uh, solving the problem not on one machine, but on many machines in the distributed environment. And then how to let all these machines behave as if they are a single machine is actually a pretty uh, uh, serious and difficult technical problem. It's not only an engineering problem. A programmer assigned to this job usually cannot figure out how to do it if they don't know enough machine learning, especially when how to do it right. And uh, you know, people tried solving these problems you know, using Hadoop, for example, or using Spark, and very often not, you know, having a lot of success. And I'm going to say a few words about why that's the case. Okay. So here is uh, maybe a, a more detailed look into that. So how do we parallelize a program if you have multiple machines? Well, basically this particular step, which uh, is uh, the consequence of maybe a long uh, effort of a machine learning theoretical study will eventually lead to some kind of update procedure that uh, you need to now kind of bring them into a parallel version. And for a mathematician, I think the greatest uh, kind of uh, uh, need we need to address is to make these two things equivalent so that they mathematically give you the same answer. And then one of the things we come up with is to make them synchronizable so that uh, you know, when each machine are doing their job, uh, have done their job, they should shake hands and exchange their notes so that we make sure everything go okay, then go to the next iteration. Well, this is actually in practice uh, a very expensive step, even though in our analysis of the algorithm we don't see that. We usually assume that the synchronization takes zero cost and also the synchronization should not have any faulty operation. And uh, also the message can actually be transmitted across the internet or the ethernet so that uh, you don't uh, uh, run into network congestions and so forth. None of these are true actually in a big distributed system. Therefore, you know, for a real distributed environment, you either do this kind of uh, synchronization like what Hadoop will automatically offer to do for you and you pay a huge cost in, you know, basically uh, latency and, uh, and in, uh, in communication and uh, overhead. Or if you just remove the synchronization, you are likely to break this equivalence and run into a divergent algorithm. That's typically happened you know, in many of the implementations. And that brings us to basically you know, a, uh, maybe a uh, renewed effort in asking how to analyze efficiency in a practical algorithm that is uh, really deployed in the field and uh, doing this combat. Right. So if you look at this typical bound that we're often seeing in our uh, algorithmic analysis, you know, which gives you a rate of convergence in the order of iterations. And first of all, this, uh, this particular analysis doesn't tell you how much iteration will cost. And also there isn't a coefficient telling you the status of the machine and other systems. But uh, in reality, there are a lot of uh, subtleties. I just want to point to maybe even one. You probably see many papers, especially nowadays, this uh, uh, deep learning papers, which uh, almost uh, force you to use a, a multi-core or multi-machine environment because it's so big. Then, very, very interestingly, the reported uh, improved performance on a cluster or on a multi-core system is typically in the form of a throughput. Throughput means that uh, the amount of uh, data you can process per unit amount of time. And as a result, if you have more machines, your throughput will grow immediately. Very, very happy results. What is not often shown in a real experiment is this curve, which is uh, the number of iterations it takes to converge. Okay, 
because uh, if you do a lousy job you know, in synchronization, when you add more and more machines, mathematically, the quality of each iteration is uh, degrading because uh, they are going to be less and less synchronized. That going to introduce more and more error. Therefore, the effectiveness, the mathematical progress of statistical game of every iteration could be very worse. Therefore, now this is an experiment we did actually with uh, uh, some uh, cluster set up. You can see that as you had more and more machine, the number of iteration it takes to converge to the optimum spot is going to be bigger. But ideally, what you want is this. When you change your machines, you are going to experience the same number of iterations, and then you have a bigger throughput, and then when you multiply this together, you get a faster convergence in the work clock sense, not in terms of the number of iterations. Right? So how to achieve that point? Well, this is a slide I'm going to skip. I meant to say that to achieve this, it is uh, not enough just to uh, design a smarter algorithm or uh, re-engineer the system. Because very often, our machine learning algorithms has uh, very interesting mathematical behaviors which uh, may uh, offer uh, different opportunities than other standard computations, such as a database operation, query optimization, and so forth. And also, you know, by knowing the details in some of the systems, sometimes the algorithm can be redesigned or optimized so that you can leverage on bidirectionally the opportunities out there. And this is in contrast with uh, many of the traditional system work or algorithmic work, which is really transaction centric. You, know, you want to maintain the algorithm to be transactionally rigorous, and uh, therefore the automatic correctness of the algorithm is the key of the operation. In machine learning, after all, we are solving a operation problem. Right. Mathematically, your goal is to go to the top of this hill. Whether you go this route, that route, you make a mistake in the middle, may be less relevant if you still know the whole direction. Right. So that's why I think there is an opportunity there to restudy system design. One of the way people do this exercise is like this, to create a super uh, you know, uh, specialized and uh, complicated thing, which uh, can work on one problem. but. Uh, if you ask this guy to do another job, say hunting in the forest, maybe this guy will, will, will run into trouble. Right? So what is really needed is uh, to you know, ask whether such a system and algorithmic co-design can lead to even a generic solution, which support not only one algorithm, but many, many different problems and many algorithms. So I'm going to share with you some of the work uh, took place in my group and also uh, with my colleagues at CMU in these uh, four dimensions on how to uh, uh, develop a general purpose architecture for uh, the system and the, and the algorithm code design to solve this particular step more effectively on the distributed environment. So I'm going to begin with something very simple. So the first thing people ask when you have a distributed system is uh, to uh, decide on what to distribute. Right? So for example, here I have a scenario where the data can be very big. I have another scenario where the parameter may be very big, or maybe both are big. Then in fact, the problem even started from here. When you divide the data to different machines, and when you divide the model to different machines, the type of statistical loss or the type of care you need to bring in to make sure things are not going wrong is going to be different. So let's take a look at how to divide this. Say many of the distributed uh, implementations of a large scale algorithm, the first thing come in mind is to do load balancing, right? Load balancing in this particular case means the following. Say I do a large, very large regression problem, and uh, say this particular regressional vector is uh, one billion dimensional. Well, don't ask me where I get this problem. In fact, this problem is solved in Google almost every second. So it is actually a very real problem, even though mathematically we can ask, well, regressing on a one billion dimensional kind of uh, uh, problem uh, seems to need infinite data and so forth, but that's actually you know, a different uh, discussion we can have because uh, most of these problems will have regularizations. Therefore, there are still in practical value you know, in having a convergent solution. But engineering-wise, how to solve this you know, using a computer cluster is actually quite interesting. You can imagine that maybe we need to do the following. We need to uh, you know, divide this uh, big vector into chunks so that they can be put onto different machines. Right. But that actually is not trivial because uh, we knew that between different dimensions, you can probably show that uh, there is uh, a chance that uh, the parameters can be coupled. They may be even collinear if you measure the same feature twice using different devices. 
And if that's introduced, then if your synchronization is not working right or not synchronized at all, and they are still in computing in parallel, then you are going to run into the statistical inconsistency problem, and then the problem can be divergent. And uh, this is actually the first hurdle already to overcome, you know, when you want to divide develop a so-called model distributed problem you know, uh, implementation. And there has been a number of work already there. And the first idea to come is to maybe have a random partition, betting on the chance that the problem is sparse and uh, the coupling between dimensions may be weak. You can prove that uh, you know, the amount of efficiency you can get out of it is going to be a function of the diameters of the data, basically how strong they are coupled together. But this is a pretty uh, weak guarantee because uh, uh, in practice, you're almost always uh, likely to run into strong, strongly coupling problems, especially in high dimensional settings. So that gives us the opportunity for maybe a system co-design. Maybe we should think about a system which uh, can uh, dynamically schedule the task in a structured aware fashion by you know, examining basically the dependencies among dimensions in the regression problem or in other high dimensional problems. Well, that creates, again, yet another problem which may be even harder because uh, testing the dimension or the, 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 co the correlations between dimensions in a very high dimensional problem by itself is a very big problem. It may be harder than even the problem, the regression problem itself, right? So how do you, you know, heuristically or systematically solve that? Well, in there, you have to leverage on some other properties in machine learning. For example, uh, in machine learning, especially in high dimensional regression, empirically people observe that uh, even though you have a very high dimensional problem, not all dimensions are equally important. If you do the iterative convergent operation, maybe every time a very small fraction of the coefficients are actually changing and many other things are not changing. Right? And uh, this actually creates you a opportunity. Maybe we should uh, focus on the scheduling on those uh, very, very small amount of uh, changing dimensions where you, know, you are likely to feel an impact. And then if you can divide those dimensions into different uh, clusters you know, as cleverly, maybe you are going to have a speed up. So in that, there has been a number of uh, heuristic or formal ideas to do priority scheduling and block scheduling. The idea is to really you know, break apart you know, highly coupled uh, you know, bring together highly coupled dimensions to the same machine and uh, detect de you know, uh, independent dimensions to different machines and then allow them to run in parallel. And this algorithm or this uh, approach is called uh, the structure aware parallelization SAP. And uh, the system part is to basically make this procedure automatic so that the people hopefully in the future don't have to do it by themselves. So we actually developed a program interface which, which allowed people to specify the dependencies and uh, schedule them you know, without uh, touching the system details. When these are done, the results are actually quite interesting. Right? You can see that uh, by comparing an unscheduled one and a scheduled one, you can see a dramatic change of the convergence rate in the experimental setting and also across different models. And you can even prove, in fact, that uh, this type of uh, uh, speed up is uh, enjoying a convergence guarantee, but also with a rate now proportional to the number of machines that you are going to bring in. Of course, this particular step here and here requires you to divide the data nicely. Here, there is a little term that tells you the cumulative you know, spectrum diameter of the subset of data on each machine. If you can reduce them effectively, then this term will disappear. Then you get the p fold upgrade of the speed. Then the second problem that we are facing is that now that you've, you, you divide your job, and hopefully uh, they give you a nice theoretical insight, even guarantee on the correctness, but uh, you still need to communicate, even though not so often. So how do you communicate? Uh, typically, we don't ask this question. We think, uh, you know, like Hadoop, uh, or like a single machine, communication shouldn't be seen by us. Somehow it's automatically taken care of. Let's say, for example, in this particular, uh, you know, now data parallel problem, which uh, makes the problem set up a little bit simpler, I'm going to run maybe a proximal gradient algorithm. And from the key updating step in here, here, and here, one can easily identify maybe which one to be the aggregate form happening on maybe a centralized form. And maybe some other forms are in the decentralized way. For example, the data dependent computation of the gradient could happen on each server machine or on each client machine because they can work, they can be obtained from a subset of data. The aggregation of all these different uh, sub data set dependent pro uh, uh, gradients can be happening on the 
uh, center, uh, the, the master, for example, by a summation. And then the projection to a particular constraint space could also happen on the server. So these are you know, a, uh, maybe a top-down uh, hierarchical design. But then when you are putting this into a system, how basically you know, this particular step is going to be dependent on the effectiveness of the communication. Shall I wait for every machine to give you this, or shall I uh, allow some in-synchrony? Right? In the past, people have been heavily relying on this model, which was actually a very famous one proposed by Valent and McCong about 20 years ago, called uh, the bulk synchronous parallel model, BSP model, which means that uh, you are going to set up barriers after each iteration, and uh, when communication happens, no computing should happen. And when computing are happens, uh, happening, no communication should happen. And this actually can be proven leading to a consistent and uh, serializable results in parallel setting. And there has been a lot of papers on that. Hadoop, Spark, for example, are all built on this so-called bridging model between communication and computing. But as I said, bridging is very difficult and expensive, especially when you want to do it iteratively for a few thousand times in the machine learning algorithm. So how to avoid that? A couple of years ago, uh, Chris Ray proposed an algorithm called uh, Hogwild, which basically says that uh, maybe the full law is right. You just ignore the communication. You know, you have multi-core machines. You just divide your job into different machines, and then let them all do their job, and then come back to you asynchronously, and you just update or aggregate on whatever you have at a particular time point. Right? And there are even theories behind that to suggest that this is the right thing to do, because uh, most of the high dimensional problems are sparse. If you have uh, this subset of data and that subset of data, they may not touch in the same dimension on different cores. Therefore, you are not likely to have a collision. Right? But uh, it turns out that uh, this algorithm isn't working very well in the distributed environment. By the way, they work well on parallel environment. There is a subtlety between parallelism and distribution. Right? Parallelism usually corresponds to multiple cores on a single machine. The communication latency between different cores are quite small, even though they are not zero. But uh, across different machines in a cluster, the latency could be seconds or even longer. And that actually, in the end, affects the results. In fact, you can see we have a theorem showing that uh, the quality of the solution depends on the mean and the variance of the latency you know, between different machines. So as a result, you know, maybe the straightforward idea is to redesign the system a bit, okay, to hopefully put a bound on the latency you can experience. Rather than going the extreme of a total synchrony or going to the other extreme of a total asynchrony, you want to stay in the middle and bound the amount of asynchrony that uh, each machine can allow, so that uh, you communicate only when this bound is exceeded. Okay, this is called uh, the still synchronous parallel algorithm operating model. And uh, again, you know, the system people are obliged to provide you a nice program interface so that this thing can be easily usable as you use Hadoop. Hopefully, you don't have to write your MPI code to directly control each machines. And this architecture is now known as the parameter server architect. It provides you a simple program interface, which are no different from a single machine memory, even though it is a distributed shared memory. And in practice, people see that, in fact, this is from our experiment, we see that the communication uh, overhead drop dramatically once you increase the amount of a synchrony bound that you can allow. Does this algorithm converge? In fact, empirically, we see that it is converging, in, in fact, even faster and better in across different algorithms. And uh, theoretically, we can also analyze this behavior. And we were able to prove that uh, you know, the quality of the divergence, uh, of the discrepancy, and also uh, the rate of uh, you know, reducing to zero, both depend on you know, the mean and the variance of uh, the asynchrony or the, or, the, or, the, or the latency across different machines. And as a result, you can actually you know, even tune the system to your needs to control, for example, these particular two numbers to get a faster convergence. The same idea also works on model parallel algorithm. For the interest of time, I should skip that. But uh, we have a similar proof showing you that uh, it doesn't affect the quality of the consistency. Then I want to spend the last part of the talk on some even more advanced, but uh, slightly more specialized issues. So there is this a very strange question we recently ran into on uh, what to communicate. Uh, this is a very strange question. Well, we are doing parallel computing on you know, uh, machine learning model training. And uh, we are supposed to communicate the intermediate results of the model training, maybe the updates and everything. That's almost like there's no question to ask there. right? You, ha you have to communicate that. 
And in fact, many of these uh, models to be communicated are in the form of a matrix of numbers, right? So you can call this uh, the matrix parameterized model. This is actually a pretty big family of models. For example, deep neural network models is a matrix. Uh, you can even say regression model is a one-dimensional matrix, although it is a vector. But uh, in real case, these kind of matrices are often very big, you know, across different models. Say so here is a model for uh, multitask regression. And um, for distance metric learning, topic model, neural network, we you know, very often run into you know, a problem which can give you a half billion or maybe a few hundred million number of parameters. Imagine communicating this thing across the ethernet in a cluster. Right? This is horrible because uh, it will choke your, you know, your network uh, almost in a second. Therefore, the full update is often not practiced in a distributed environment. Uh, just because it is too expensive you know, to even you know, transmit the intermediate updates across the system. So that actually caused us to think about uh, whether this is really the only thing we can do in terms of uh, distributed communication. Well, it turns out that the form of this update delta W often has a low rank structure, especially when you are squeezing down the number of uh, data used to compute this. For example, if you are computing this data delta W using one data point, you can imagine the rank should be one, shouldn't be more than one, right? Because that's where the data source comes from. In fact, you can always establish that uh, the delta can be expressed in the form of an outer product of two vectors. One is uh, data dependent, the other is uh, probably you know, parameter dependent. And then it is the assemblage from these uh, two pre-updates that leads to this uh, very you know, heavy duty full update of a matrix. What if uh, we focus on communicating the pre-updates instead of the updates? That potentially gives you a lighter communication overhead. Right? So this is the idea called sufficient vectors, which uh, we explored uh, in the past few months. And I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the results. There are some uh, difficulties in establishing equivalence between these two. Because uh, for the full updates, it is uh, very naturally following the natural computational architecture, which is uh, like a master-slave architecture, because uh, you can easily aggregate all these uh, you know, you know, uh, update matrices from different clients into here by a simple summation. Therefore, you can distribute them in a very straightforward fashion. The pre-updates actually uh, cannot be easily aggregated. Because once you aggregate all these uh, pre-updates, you start to lose the low rankness. They stop being a auto product vectors. They become a matrix. Therefore, you are going to be running into the very expensive thing. Therefore, you have to basically transmit these uh, pre-updates one data at a time, which is a little bit expensive. But on the other hand, nowadays, people routinely use stochastic algorithms or mini-batch algorithms in which every update is actually using a small amount of data. Therefore, you could imagine that uh, in practice, the implementation of uh, a stochastic gradient algorithm could benefit from this uh, new communication protocol. So, and the good thing about this communication protocol is that uh, it has a much smaller storage trace because you don't have to store the matrix at all. You can just store the, the vector form and also maybe uh, uh, the size of the batch of that. And this uh, storage is also elastic. You don't have to pre-allocate the whole thing. It really could be in the requested on needs you know, in your local machines. There is also a communication benefit, which I'm going to mention in a second. But uh, just to give you, you know, a empirical evidence, we do see that across the algorithm, uh, different models, like I think there's a, a distance metric learning, uh, multitask learning, and maybe a topic model, you actually see universal kind of uh, improvements in terms of the convergence rate. And we actually have evidence showing that the amount of communications you know, between the full matrix and the sufficient vectors, even though you have to broadcast it in a, in a data-dependent fashion, is much reduced. So I want to say a few words about how to do the broadcast. Right? So here I stop short off giving you the guarantee on whether what I did just now is theoretically you know, uh, uh, consistent or safe. But uh, to discuss that, we need to basically understand the last bit, where is, which is uh, how this message should be communicated. Remember that we are very, especially machine learning people, are very much used to this uh, particular architecture, which is the, the server worker or the master slave architecture. You know, from the server, Hadoop, and uh, Spark, you know, all of this type of uh, 
architecture, meaning that uh, you have a centralized place to aggregate all the messages, and you have uh, maybe unbounded number of uh, slaves to do the partial work. And then the thing to be communicated are those uh, work that needs to be done. For example, the full matrix of the parameter and also the full matrix of the parameter updates. By the way, these directions need to be sent, uh, these messages need to be sent in both directions because uh, for each worker to compute the proper updates, they need to have the latest possible version of the full parameters itself. Therefore, they have to have this message. Then in the decentralized fashion, which is actually popular in our cell phone network and other you know, uh, computational infrastructure, the idea is to maybe only send this uh, delta, the pre-updates. But again, as I said, pre-updates is as big as the full updates if you don't do any reduction. Therefore, how can we actually uh, change the idea uh, a, a bit? Right. So here I have some comparison between the two architecture which I'm going to skip. But I want to point out that sending this uh, sufficient factor uh, is uh, requiring you to switch away from the master slave architecture to the, uh, to the P2P architecture because, uh, as I said, the pre-updates cannot be, you know, uh, aggregated, you know, before they sent, uh, before they were communicated. So that leads us to this peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer communication, meaning that uh, every machine has to broadcast its uh, pre-updates, which are the two low-dimensional vectors, into all the other machines, so that the post-updates can be computed on each machine locally from these low-rank, uh, you know, pre-updates. And uh, that probably will cause you to worry some because, uh, well, that means I need to have a n square or no p square number of messages in the whole network because uh, you know it is, it is a broadcast scheme. And if my network is very big, then that's going to have you another factor, a you know, quadratic factor of the complexity. Well, in theory, that's the case, but uh, it turns out that we have uh, some tricks to reduce this uh, particular protocol. Uh, again, from a quadratic complexity to linear complexity in, some, in terms of the size of the network. One of these ideas is called uh, the partial broadcast. So imagine that this is a machine learning algorithm, which is uh, not to pass the message only one time to the rest of the network. Iteratively, it will basically keep sending to the neighbors. And you imagine that uh, even if I broadcast my message to two neighbors in the next iteration, that message will be relayed to the next neighbors in our next iteration. So somehow there is this effect of information relay in the network, even if you just broadcast your message partially to a subset of neighbors. So this idea can be formalized and can be analyzed. But the effect is that you are going to generate a, com a communication complexity which is only linear to the size of the network and with a constant which is uh, uh, roughly giving you the size of the neighborhood you have to broadcast, which can be very small. And secondly, you can also select the volume of the message by doing the so-called uh, sufficient factor selection. You don't have to transmit all the sufficient factors. In fact, after you compute all these pre-updates, empirically, especially in large data setting, many of the updates are redundant. You can pre-screen those redundancy using some formula and then take out only those sufficient factors which are less redundant and send them out. So by these two folds of tricks, you actually could dramatically reduce also the, trans the communication overhead, the, the number and the size, the number of messages basically you know, in the network. So previously I talked about the size of the message and now it is the number of the messages. And when you put these two ideas together, you're going to enjoy this. Again, across different algorithms, distance metric learning, multitask regression, and topic model, you're going to see you know, a, a pretty uh, uh, strong you know, improvement in terms of uh, the speed of convergence you know, uh, across different, in here we compared quite a few different, uh, by the way, this is not a, a topic, it is a deep, deep neural network and implemented using popular alternatives versus ours. And you can see uh, you know, the, the improvement is uh, seen across different models. And also this idea is scaling very well to the size of the cluster. When you add more and more machines, you're likely to see you know, a close to linear increase of the power or of the, uh, the, the ability in handling larger problems. And uh, with uh, the assumption of uh, uh, sufficient factor broadcast and uh, under both you know, a full communication uh, broadcast and a partial broadcast, 
we can establish uh, the consistency results, which I'm not going to spell out in detail. But the take home message is that you are going to, you know, you know, converge to the solution, which is uh, no different from uh, sending out the full update matrix to every neighbor in a distributed network. So that's again, you know, another advantage, you know, in exploring system and uh, algorithmic code design to get uh, a faster solution across different uh, type of algorithms. And this idea actually could also coexist with some other ideas. So for example, I talked first about the prompt server idea, which is uh, a centralized uh, communication protocol. I also talked about the sufficient factor broadcast, which is uh, a peer-to-peer uh, -peer decentralized protocol. These two things doesn't have to be excluding each other. In fact, they could coexist and, uh, and uh, then uh, communicate uh, the amount of uh, model parameters dependent on you know, uh, the needs and also the circumstances. For example, in a typical, well, I want to claim that I'm not a fan of deep neural network per se, but uh, this is a thing that has been used in many companies. So we, you know, as a researcher, have to at least address the engineering problems, how to get them fast. Right. So here we observe the following interesting behavior. If you look at this whole deep neural network, multiple layers, the size of the parameters actually is not uniform. Right. In the, you know, I think in the uh, later part, I think this is the early part of the network, you have very high dimensional matrix because uh, you are defining low level features you know, at the pixel level. Right. But uh, in the higher level network part, you are going to work with uh, high level features which are, are much more lower dimensional. Therefore, the number of parameters to be communicated appear to be less. Therefore, you know, these two type of parameters could enjoy maybe two different uh, communication protocols. This one may benefit from a sufficient factor broadcast, and that part could benefit from a prompt server centralized communication. And that's actually what we did. And after you do this, you are going to see now a huge improvement, again, over the scalability of uh, you know, deep neural network models uh, that is popular out there. Like, for example, here we have uh, deep neural network models uh, implemented in CAFE, in TensorFlow. I think the name of the network is called uh, the VGG18 or something. I think it's one of the winners of the ImageNet competition, which makes them very popular. The thing I want to say here is that uh, we didn't implement this model. These models are implemented by others using TensorFlow and using CAFE. We basically just provide a new low-level communication layer for their messages to be communicated across machines. Right? So originally it was a single machine implementation, and now we have a uh, distributed implementation. They also have their own distributed implementation, which in our opinion is very lousy, and we compare. You can see that uh, this is the performance of uh, you know, different uh, implementations across more and more number of machines. And you can see that uh, in a terrible scenario in this particular case, the TensorFlow model start to go worse when you add more machines, which is not actually surprising because uh, if you have a too big a model and you add more machines and force them to communicate across machines, they choke the network and make convergence even worse. You will see some other graphs later where the TensorFlow distributed version does improve, but not as much as what we did in here. So here, again, I want to make sure that all these curves are measured over convergence time, not over the throughput, which in my opinion is a more accurate and a meaningful uh, measurement of uh, the quality of computing. So here I gave you just a few more comparisons. Now it is not just one deep neural network as you see in the previous slides. We have a few other deep neural networks which are basically image winners over the past several years. And uh, they range in terms of the architect and also in terms of the number of parameters. There are some smaller models which uh, has roughly, let's say, 60 million parameters, which are you know, not too big, and uh, therefore when you add more machines, the network is still able to handle the communication. Therefore, you see these uh, you know, uh, improvements with uh, more and more resources, even using the native TensorFlow distributed version. But uh, when you have a larger model, which has like 100 or 200 million parameters, okay, the whole thing start to, 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 to go down, and then you can see this uh, terrible degradation of uh, the distributed results. But instead, you know, in our uh, protocol where the SVB and also the, uh, the prompt server are all brought to bear uh, to reduce the communication, we do see still a linear upgrades of uh, the performance 
of the convergence rate. This is a similar solution uh, for a different uh, implementation of the same network in CAFE. And uh, still, you know, I think we do quite well you know, using uh, the protocols I just mentioned. So that brings to the end of uh, my talk. I just want to share with you our experiences uh, in uh, uh, jointly considering algorithmic innovation and also system communication, and hopefully do this uh, iteratively to enable a co-designed solution. And these are the points I visited in the talk. But I think there are more questions than answers nowadays you know, in the scalable and uh, you know, universally mountable machine learning programs on different architectures. So I, I do want to bring uh, attention uh, to the, uh, et cetera, the theory community to look into these type of problems which uh, does always have this part. Basically, you are going to have a unideal hardware infrastructure system, which uh, factors into the very performance of the computing and how to you know, uh, analyze that and how to mitigate their negative effects is, I think, to be a, a very interesting problem. Okay. So again, I didn't really touch all the issues. There are many other issues I don't have time to cover. But uh, if you are interested, I'd be very happy to take them offline to discuss more. At the end, you know, the goal of uh, the project happening at CMU and also at my startup is really to turn this uh, very you know, intimidating uh, you know, picture of uh, generating machine learning and AI solutions into something that is uh, more standardized and more encapsulated so that uh, you can really intimately and carefully you know, consider many different uh, system algorithmic and infrastructure choices. But of course, when you are done with this, you know, you hopefully you know, can you know, offer better performance in all these different technical dimensions. But to the users, I have to emphasize that many of the users like to see machine learning like this. They really don't want to meddle, mess up with uh, the inner details of the system, not even programming their own algorithm. They may just want to deploy their solutions on top of their hardware, and then letting the middle layer to be taken care of by some providers. And that's, I think, what uh, uh, our research is uh, trying to lead toward. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.